This is a video response to the video, The Case Against the Book of Enoch. Uh, so, some of the things I'm, I'm going to be mentioning in this video response, I'm just basically going to be stating what I believe. And so, if you challenge what I'm saying, and if you want to see the evidence, I can present the evidence. I can give you the sources. But with that said, I'm just going to state what I believe, and then if anyone wants to follow up on what I've said to check and see if what I said is correct, they can ask me further if they need to, or they can look it up themselves. So with that said, I watched the entire video and I took notes throughout the each, typing them into a, a Word document, and I typed up my responses, essentially. So I'm going to go through each point, and it may seem a little bit disconnected, uh, because I didn't type out an entire essay. I just was typing things that I thought were important to respond to in each section. So. The first thing I wanted to mention is the most convincing uh, evidence for the Book of Enoch being scripture is that we can prove from scripture and early history that the first Christians were Essenes and that the Essenes were not a pre-Christian Jewish sect as the scholars assert. You, I believe I can provide proof from the scriptures and from historical evidence that the Essenes only came into existence after the Messiah was um, crucified and rose from the dead. So with that said, if the Essenes were the first, the very first Christians, then they represent what the Messiah believed and taught to his apostles as the apostles were the first Christians, and their, their followers were the first Christians. So if we can prove from the New Testament and from history combined that the Essenes were the first Christians, then whatever the Essenes believed, because they were the first Christians and were not corrected by the apostles, that makes everything the Essenes believed true and to be accepted. So they, the entire Essene community, accepted the Book of Enoch as scripture. You can see that clearly in their writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and in their writings which quote and refer to the, the Book of Jubilees as scripture. So, uh, and the Book of Jubilees likewise refers to the book of Enoch as scripture. Yep. So, we can clearly show that if the Essenes were the first Christians, then that proves the issue right there that Enoch is scripture. But now, continuing on that, uh, to the next point, all the earliest Christians considered the book of Enoch scripture. There is not one Christian that we know of before the late 3rd century and early 4th century that rejected the Book of Enoch as scripture. Every individual that mentions the Book of Enoch or mentions something contained in, in the Enoch books only you refer to that content and, or call that the Book of Enoch itself as scripture, as authoritative. So. The fact that every single Christian accepted it until the late 3rd century is a strong argument in favor of it. How could all the Christians accept it if it's not scripture? That would require a mass deception even among the original apostles and the, the first Christians, which is not just not possible. As the apostles were there, and they would have had, they would have had exposed any false uh, doctrines in their community. So, 
with that said, um, I'm going to next say, uh, okay, so it's used as scripture in the book of Jude, as we all know, uh, and the epistle of Barnabas, it's used as scripture. The epistle of Barnabas was, in fact, those scholars will disagree, but it was clearly written by the apostle Barnabas. So we have an apostle, the apostle, uh, the brother apostle of Paul, using Enoch as scripture. Okay, and it, we also have the book of Enoch referenced as scripture by the Messiah, uh, not just with the Son of Man thing, which we'll discuss later, but also with, he references Enoch chapter 15 as scripture. Okay, um, which I'll discuss a little bit later. But so, now I wanted to say something that uh, I find a serious error with what you said. You said, um, wait, hold on, I'll, I'll mention that in a second. But let me just say, I still maintain that the Bible cannot be truly understood unless Enoch is included. I know you have attempted to uh, refute that in your video, uh, but I still maintain that. Um, and now I want to say that tons of other books that are scripture, or at the very least which claim to be scripture, reference and quote the book of Enoch as scripture. So in other words, you would have to accuse all of them as being false deceivers, false prophets, or just completely incompetent individuals if their usage of the book of Enoch was in fact like if the book of Enoch is not scripture then their usage and endorsement of the book of Enoch simply exposes them as being incompetent or liars at best okay so these are the books at the very least these are the books that I know of that clearly endorse the book of Enoch as scripture the book of Jubilees, the testaments of the twelve patriarchs, the book of Abraham and the Dead Sea Scrolls the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, 2 Peter, Jude, and the Epistle of Barnabas. All those books clearly endorse the Book of Enoch as scripture. The Book of Jubilees uh, references the majority of the Book of Enoch as scripture, all five sections. The and the each each of these works adds references to the Book of Enoch, which indicate that they accepted the entirety of the Book of Enoch as scripture. And I'll discuss later the uh, the fluidness and the unity of all five works uh, of the first Enoch. So, now I'm going to say that uh, the tr the, I, will, I will tell you that I do not believe there is a cover-up. There was not a a conspiracy to, to to hide the book of Enoch, which they knew to be true. Rather, as we can see, even in the time of Tertullian, the church father to Tertullian, people began doubting whether or not the book of Enoch was in fact a written by Enoch. They believed how could it have survived the flood. That was their primary objection. Tertullian makes the argument that it easily could have been uh, survived the Book of Enoch, uh, survived the flood by being given to Noah, preserved on the ark, or revealed prophetically through divine revelation to Noah afterwards to be restored. Um, and I think he references the, how that the same thing happened with Ezra which is described in 2nd Esdras, how all the scriptures were lost and Ezra restored the scriptures by the Spirit revealing the scriptures to Ezra and he wrote out every single scripture. So, and the second part of its being rejected is it's the church fathers later on began to disagree with what the book of Enoch taught. Essentially, the primary issues with why the book of Enoch is so offensive to individuals is the idea of the literal versus the allegorical. 
around the mid third century there began a movement in which the allegorical interpretation of scripture was emphasized over the literal at that time it began the, the doctrine of the millennial kingdom millennial millennialism uh, began to be chided, began to be looked down upon and condemned as a heresy, the Millennial Kingdom, because it was viewed as a fle too fleshy. And uh, so anything that uh, referenced pleasure to the flesh or uh, living in, in the, the kingdom in your flesh, so the Millennial Kingdom refers to us being uh, living with the Messiah and God in our physical bodies in the flesh this was a doctrine which uh, was not acceptable to many of the early Christians around starting in the mid third century because they were so hooked on the allegory of scriptures rather than the literal interpretation so much so that they began Christians began rejecting the book of Revelation of John from the canon because it taught literal truths it it taught that literal flesh pleasures would be observed in the millennial kingdom so all this flesh fleshly prophecies and books which emphasize the flesh uh, they began rejecting and so the that was the beginning of the reason why Book of Enoch was rejected. Uh, but eventually, it came to the point where angels having sex with humans was just too fleshly for them. It was so out there that they could not accept it because of their bias and pre pre assumptions. Okay, so it was their own beliefs which made it so that they did not want to accept the validity of the Book of Enoch being scripture. So that is the primary reason why it was rejected from most Bibles. But it was not rejected from all Bibles. It was included in some Greek manuscripts as we see of the Bible. Um, continuing from where I left off, I apologize, I had to bring it to a stopping point because I was interrupted, but basically th we see the Book of Enoch in uh, at least one copy of the Septuagint version of the Bible. Uh, it's in the Vatican Library. And uh, we also see the Book of Enoch accepted in some Bibles of the Armenian Church, the Armenian Orthodox Church. And of course, we, we have discussed that the Ethiopian Church uh, accepts it as scripture. But here is something which perhaps you didn't know. It's not only the Ethiopian Christians or the Ethiopian Church that accepts the Book of Enoch as scripture, but rather it is also the Ethiopian Jews, the Falasha Jews, or what is known as Beta Israel. They accept the Book of Enoch as scripture. That's going to be a crucial point of discussion and argument later on in my video. But so, at any rate, I'm going to move on now. And I'm going to respond uh, to the, the quote. I'm, I'm going to quote uh, something you said, and I'm going to respond to that. This is your quote. The Bible as we have today is what we know we can trust. It is the truth. We can be sure of it. It is the only standard of measure we have for everything else to test it against. The true test is how does it line up with the Bible? And then you go on to say several moments later, 
what does the Bible itself say as to whether First Enoch should be accepted? Does it line up with the Bible or contradict it? And does the Bible itself make a case for Enoch or against it? That is a completely false and fallacious statement and not scriptural. Okay, first of all, the book of Enoch, if it's true, came before the Bible. It was prophecy before the Bible was written. So if the Bible contradicts the book of Enoch, it would be the Bible which should be, should be rejected, not the book of Enoch. Uh, Enoch, if you actually look at it and read it, you see all the scholars essentially predate the entire book to, even though they believe it's in five distinct sections, they predate it to the Messiah. And the book of Enoch contains clear prophecies which are of the Messiah and past the Messiah. Many things beyond the Messiah it also prophesies of. So Enoch is clearly prophetic uh, by anyone who's read it, and its message is pure and righteous if you read what its moral message is. Now, in my belief, any book that is clear prophecy and is pure and righteous is scripture until proven otherwise. And so Enoch, which comes before the Bible, ultimately must be accepted first before you can accept any other book. Uh, uh, furthermore, I just want to say that all skeptics of the Bible bring up tons of so-called contradictions of the scripture. But what do you and other Christians do? You assume those Christians, uh, those contradictions, excuse me, are not contradictions, even if you don't have a good answer to refute their alleged contradiction at a time. This shows you unfairly and inconsistently defend the Bible as scripture and reject other books by raising the standard much higher than you do for the Bible. This is unfair and is a double standard. As such, you must test all books equally. And if you test the Bible in the same way you tested Enoch, you would either accept them both or reject them both. Uh, because a lot of your allegations are similar to allegations of skeptics of the Bible. And you need to think, as a Jew or a Christian who, accept the book, who accepts the book of Enoch, and think, can this passage be explained and supported and made to agree with the Bible? But you never did that. You just saw an apparent contradiction, and you assumed that that apparent contradiction was in fact a contradiction. That is not a correct way to do it. What I said before about the book, uh, how the Bible should not be the standard, I'm going to further explain that now. Okay, in the book of Deuteronomy, it clearly says any prophet who claims to you something as a word of God, you are to test that prophet in what he says. How do you test the prophet with the Bible if the Bible hasn't been written yet? Okay, so Moses was a prophet. According to Moses, because he was a prophet, he had to be tested. How do you test Moses when none of the Bible had been written yet? How do you test uh, any prophet that was a new prophet if their book hadn't been written yet to test it with. So, the book of Isaiah. You have to test the book of Isaiah by using something that came before the book of Isaiah. And what whatever came before it, that prophet, you also had to test with something that came before that prophet. And likewise, the previous prophet and the previous prophet. In other words, the entire Bible, you, according to the book of Deuteronomy, the entire Bible has to be tested by something outside of the Bible, not the Bible. Okay? Only when the Bible is proven to be scripture can it be used as a test of other books. Okay? So, that's where you err. The Bible itself, which you accept as scripture, clearly teaches clearly teaches that the 
the books of the, the books of the Bible and all other prophets are to be tested by the Spirit and not by the Bible. Okay, so that is a primary uh, place where you err. Uh, hold on a moment. Sorry. Um, so we get to test things by the Spirit and not by the the Bible. That's how we know the Bible is true by testing it by the Spirit. And so now, um, okay. And furthermore, your arguments clearly ignore how there are different manuscripts. Uh, of the Bible, and that the translations of the Bible often completely mutilate the meaning of passages in the Bible. Translations are not very accurate, they distort the original message of Scripture, and propagate false understandings of Scripture. So, when you acknowledge that manuscripts of the Bible can sometimes, can, sometimes can contain false readings, and that you have to know what the true reading is, by looking at the better manuscripts, and that translations can also alter the meaning of scripture, and you have to look at the original uh, language that it's being translated from. How can you use that standard, that very loose standard for the Bible, and not do the same thing with the Book of Enoch? You have not looked at how the translations differ, because if you did, some of your allegations you would not have made, and secondly, you did not look at the different manuscripts of Enoch. Because if you did, you would have known that some of the manuscripts do not contain the things that you refer to as errors or impossibilities. So the fact that you do not impose the same standards of, of uh, criticism to books outside of the Bible is completely unjustified. It's a double standard and contradicts the book of Deuteronomy which says we are to test every prophet in the same way by testing them in accordance with the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. But you have not criticized the book of Enoch according to the spirit of truth, but rather according to your false uh, version of the Bible, your in and your false understanding and interpretation of the Bible. You are basing it on your version of the Bible, which is a translation that is flawed, and based on faulty manuscripts. How can you do this? And you base your, a lot of your beliefs on scholars who are essentially atheists or agnostics or very secular and liberal Christians who don't really believe much of anything of the true Christian message. So, your standard of evaluating the Book of Enoch is flawed from the start. And that is the primary criticism I make in this video series. Uh, so, now I'm going to go on, and uh, so, let me see, okay, so basically according to the Bible we see in the book of Deuteronomy, I think it is, or in one of the other books of the Law of Moses, it says we are not to be a false witness, and it says what a, how, how we know what a false witness is. A false witness is anyone who makes an accusation which they cannot prove to be true. Okay, in other words, slander. Slander, if you look up, the, uh, look up the definition of slander, slander is not necessarily false, but slander is something which is not based on something concrete or, or down, like a strong foundation. It's basically hearsay. Hearsay is a false witness, okay? So your, uh, your objections against the Book of Enoch would, uh, serve in the court of law as a false witness, a, true, a biblical court of law, that is, one that's abiding by the laws of the Bible. So according to a biblical standard, your objections, even if the book of Enoch, Enoch is not scripture, is not true, your objections are not sound and fair. They are based on such a loose examination, uh, a very low low, uh, very unfair and uh, closed-minded interpretation, it's all based on primarily hearsay, your 
accusation accusations will be will be rejected as uh, as uh, false witness, and because it's false witness, according to the Bible, every individual who testifies falsely against another is to receive the punishment that is to be uh, received for the person you're for the crime that you are claiming against. So, according to the Bible, false prophets are to be stoned to death. Capital punishment crime. They are to receive a capital punishment. If you are a false witness to someone claiming to be a prophet, you deserve to be receive the death penalty for claiming someone to be a false prophet when they're not a false prophet. So you need to be really careful about calling individuals false prophets, okay? It's fine and fair to say you're not sure if they're a prophet, but to state so definitively that the Book of Enoch was written by false prophets maybe is a very serious charge you you bring up against the author of this book or these books the i mean or these authors of the, of these books so the fact that you bring up this allegation is a serious matter and you need to think you need to really think whether you are 100 percent convinced that the book of enoch yeah, your analysis is justified and correct. Because if it's not, then you would deserve death uh, in accordance with the book of, of Deuteronomy. Okay. So this is very serious. Um, I'm going to continue, but uh, just pause for a moment. Okay, continuing. Um, so... Now, I just cannot believe you have used the five-book argument about First Enoch. Have you actually read the arguments and theories, the evidence that is supposed to be evidence, by the scholars who originated this five-book claim uh, theory? Have you looked at the evidence and arguments and, and theories in support of this ridiculous belief about the Book of Enoch being divided into five different sections that originally were distinct and written by different authors. I have actually looked into them, and all their arguments are completely unfounded. Uh, first of all, these individuals who made up this theory are the same individuals who reject the Gospels as historically inaccurate. The letters of Paul, they do not believe were written by Paul, they believe the Law of Moses was written no earlier than the time of Ezra, uh, so and other things too. But so the fact that you blindly accept their dating schemes of extra books, but reject their dating schemes of the Bible, shows your inability to be fair in your analysis and consistent. If you were fair and consistent and did not have a double standard, you would be uh, you would be bl blindly accepting these scholar statements on everything they said, or on nothing. You cannot pick and choose what you want to blindly believe from what these scholars say. And you need to look at, at their arguments and see if their arguments for those dating, uh, such a late dating of the Book of Enoch, are valid or not. You can't just assume what you, I believe you are doing. Um, but now, even if your theory about them being five distinct books is true, that does not matter, as they would still all be written by Enoch. Okay? Being five distinct original uh, compositions does not mean Enoch did not write all those sections. And now, the parables section, I would say, is clearly referenced as authoritative by the letter of Jude, uh, in the letter of Jude, it references a phrase that occurs only elsewhere in the parable section. It's the phrase, the seventh from Adam. That phrase occurs in the parable section, which clearly is a reference and a, an endorsement of the book of parables. And Messiah, by his usage, usage of the Son of Man term, okay, that is a clear endorsement, which I will discuss in a little bit further. Uh, because you, 
believe that the Son of Man reference is not a strong argument. But, so now I will say this. The parables section is also accepted by the Ethiopian Jews, the Beta Israel, or the Falasha Jews. How do you explain how non-Christians came to accept all five sections of the Book of Enoch as scripture and as one composition? If the sections were compiled after the Messiah, and if the parable section was a Christian writing, then the philosopher Jews most certainly would have not accepted what they knew did not uh, formally what they knew did not formally exist and was written by a Christian. In other words, if they had the Book of Enoch already, which they did, they wouldn't have added in the parables section after the Christians wrote it. They would have rejected it because they would have known it was written by a Christian. Or they would have known, well, we don't have this book. We don't have this portion of Enoch. We're not going to include it in our version of Enoch. But the Falasha Jews have the parable section in the book of Enoch. That is only explained if the parable section was written before the Messiah was even born. Which, if that's true, and it is, that proves the book of parables is true in scripture because it is prophetic. Have you ever read the book of Enoch, a parable section? I'm sure you have, and if you have, you will see that it is clearly prophetic if it was written before Christ. That's why so many try to argue that it was written after Christ, because the prophecies are so clear about the Messiah. So, to reject the book of parables when it was clearly written before the Messiah was born is just ignoring the fact that this is authentic prophecy. Okay. Um, we also have uh, the other four sections make a reference to the astronomical book, clearly indicating that all the portions of Enoch regard the calendar portion as scripture. Okay. So, Every single section regarded the calendar section as scripture, and um, we also have the revelation of John. Use, he uses a chronological scheme which only makes sense in light of the book of Enoch's calendar section. For John says a year has 360 days. He says this in the revelation of John. The only scripture which says that a year has 360 days is the book of Enoch which says there's 364 days but four of those extra days are not to be counted in the official counting. In other words the book of Enoch says a year is to be counted as having 360 days just like the revelation of John says and not like the Jews say that the year is supposed to have 354 the lunar calendar which I'll discuss later. Um, so, furthermore, the Dead Sea Scrolls affirm that all five sections are, uh, were accepted as scripture and all considered written by Enoch, by the Essenes. How do we know this? Because all five sections were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and every writing in the Dead Sea Scrolls was a sacred writing. Every writing was a religious writing. There was no secular writing there, indicating that this was a library of books they accepted as scripture, as sacred. And that is further testified by the other writings they have and how their writings depend on these extra books and often cite them as authoritative in the basis of their doctrines. So, now, most people believe that the, the Book of Parables section was not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's not true, however. There is a scroll, which is known as the Aramaic Enoch Scroll. According to many, uh, many individuals uh, of the Dead Sea Scroll team, who actually saw the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves and were involved with the selling process and things like that. 
they testified themselves that they saw the complete book of Enoch. There was a version of the book of Enoch completely preserved. You know how the book of Isaiah was completely preserved in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls? We have that same phenomenon with the book of Enoch. It's called the Aramaic Enoch Scroll, and all five sections are preserved in it. They saw the book of parables in the Aramaic form in that complete book of Enoch that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But it has not been published. But uh, countless, well not countless, but as many as I think it was ten individuals all testified or witnessed to the existence of the parable section in, in this book of Enoch. I'm pretty sure it was around 10, but it might have been lower, but I know at least several individuals who were prominent in the Dead Sea Scroll scholarship and behind the editing and release and publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls testified themselves to the Book of Enoch's existence in the complete Aramaic scroll with the Book of Parables being preserved. So all five sections, all five sections were preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay, which indicate uh, the Dead Sea Scroll community accepted all five portions as being written by Enoch and Scripture. So, um, so now I'm basically saying there's no explanation for how a book being written all of a sudden could be accepted in, in its entirety so easily if it was a false writing. When the Book of Mormon was introduced within the first year, there was an expose of its plagiarism and falsehood. We have no records of these exposés of any of these extra writings. Uh, and if we did, uh, there surely would not have been so much acceptance of the Book of Enoch as there was. Uh, but also the prophecies of the Book of Enoch prove itself, as well as I said, the moral purity. It is highly improbable that the five books were compiled after the Messiah, as I said, because the flesh of Jews would not have accepted the, that Christian version, and yet they did, which proves that the Book of Enoch, in its current form, was known and accepted before the Messiah. Thus, when Jude and others quote or reference the Book of Enoch, they are clearly quoting the entire thing as an authority, and not only a part of it, for they would have had no knowledge of it formerly being separate works, but they would have always known it to be the same one book. They would not quote from one portion as authoritative and another portion as false. They would have rejected the entire thing if they thought some of it was false. First Enoch is not a composite work, and those dating schemes are completely unreliable if you actually looked at their arguments. Their basis of dating is once uh, again supposed inaccuracies and contradictions, and furthermore, they assume that if there is a prophecy of an event, that it is not a prophecy, and therefore date it as being written around the time that the event is it is describing in prophecy occurred. This is not fair and open-minded scholarship. And if you apply the same standards to the Bible as it contains the prophecies of tons of, of events, you would, ha you would have to date most of the Bible hundreds if not thousands of years after when we knew they were actually written. This dating process is complete bias against the belief of prophecy and scripture in general. And the fact that you blindly endorse their dating schemes shows you have no true understanding of open mindedness and fairness, and that you have a huge double standard. And the Book of Jubilees, as I earlier said, is quoted and referenced as authoritative in the New Testament. For example, according to the Book of Acts, According to the book of Acts, Moses killed the Egyptian when he was 40 years old. No other book says this except the book of Jubilees. Okay, so where did, where did he get this? Where did Stephen get this information? It was not from the Torah, it was not from the Bible, because the Bible does not contain this information. 
Rather, it's the book of Jubilee, which explicitly says the 40 years that he killed, when it, that was how old he was when he killed the Egyptian. Um, there are other places where there are clear references or quotations even of the book of Jubilees, even with the Messiah uh, essentially quoting the book of Jubilees. Um, so, since the New Testament endorses the Book of Jubilees as scripture, we look at the Book of Jubilees, and the Book of Jubilees clearly endorses all five sections as of Enoch as scripture and authoritative. For each of the five sections appears in the summary of Jubilees of the Enochian account of the Enochian history. I'm going to pause and continue in the next video. In the next portion of this video. Okay, so this is a continuation of my response to the video that uh, the the case against the Book of Enoch. So I'm going to continue with this, and now um, basically the Book of Parables, as just to sum up, so it was it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, was accepted as scripture by the Ethiopian Jews, not just the Christians, but the Jews. And um, also accepted and uh, endorsed by the Book of Jubilees, and the Book of Jubilees was accepted by the Essenes and the Ethiopian Jews and the Ethiopian Christians, uh, and the New Testament itself. So, uh, now continuing, the one reference in the Book of Daniel isn't really even a reference to uh, the Son of Man. Um, well, many Christians think it is, but really it says, like a son of man. So the like a son of man is not even the son of man phrase. Uh, I, I believe that, that that phrase in the book of Daniel is very ambiguous, uh, and this would not be a well-known prophecy. It's one obscure little phrase. And what do we have with the book of Ezekiel? How he says, son of man. He uses son of man. He calls Ezekiel the son of man. Uh, like, I don't know how many times, but probably close to a hundred times. I might be exaggerating the number at least, but it, it's at least 40 different times that uh, he refers to Ezekiel, the angel or God or whatever, refers to Ezekiel as the son of man. So, the fact that Daniel says, like a son of man, there's no indication of a messianic designation. It has no real force. It's very ambiguous, as I said. It's an obscure little thing. And do we really think that the Jews, when they heard the Messiah say, the Son of Man, referring to himself, would uh, they would automatically associate that with the book of Daniel? No. It's such an obscure little thing that it has very little evidence in support of it being a, a clear messianic picture. It's a very obscure messianic picture, like a son of man. Ezekiel was a son of man, so it's not a very clear uh, prophecy that can be. It doesn't explain how the Messiah, why the Messiah favored that term so much and used it so heavily. The reason he favored that term is because he believed the Book of Enoch was so important, and he knew that a lot of Jews rejected the Book of Enoch. So basically, what he's saying is. I'm the son of man, implying he accepts the book of Enoch as scripture, and you should too. Okay, so, uh, and I will elaborate that on a little bit um, with uh, later on when I show how the Messiah references chapter 15 of Enoch as scripture. So, um, Uh, so, okay, so however, it is very clear in the book of Enoch how the Son of Man term is a messianic designation. It's very explicit. Not obscure and ambiguous like in the book of Daniel, but it's very clear, undeniably a messianic designation. And as I said, the Falasha Jews accept it. So it's not a Christian composition. So, and the Bible uses the term Son of Man uh, as a possible designation only once in the Old Testament, but it uses it over a hundred times in the New Testament. 
this unusual clinging to this one obscure reference in Daniel makes no sense. However, if Enoch is scripture, and we see the reference to the Son of Man uh, was included almost 20 times in the book of parables, then his usage of it makes sense, especially since he's using it in order to endorse the book of Enoch. Furthermore, the phrase, the elect one, that's the term, the elect one, is a messianic title which originates also in the parable section, sit many times, and is found nowhere else in any book of scripture. Except, but it is used as a messianic title in the New Testament. So the New Testament includes the messianic title, the elect one, and that phrase, the elect one, is found only in the book of Enoch. Once again, the elect one phrase is a clear endorsing of the book of Enoch's terminology, the messianic terminology. Um, other messianic titles, such as the righteous one, uh, which are found in Enoch and nowhere else of the Old Testament era, as far as I am aware of, also are found and used in the New Testament as messianic designations. Um, and you are wrong. If Messiah is indeed using a phrase from a book as a messianic designation to himself, he is implicitly endorsing the book. To use a phrase from her in heretical writing would not be the ways of a righteous and holy God. So if, that, if he was indeed using the book of Enoch, uh, the parable section of the book of Enoch, uh, as his source for that messianic designation, that would be an endorsement of the Book of Enoch, uh, rather than what you say, as it wouldn't be necessarily an endorsement. If if the Messiah was a righteous individual, it would be an endorsement, because no righteous individual would use a term from her in heretical writing, and that would encourage people to use uh, that false writing unless the person clarified. But there's no clarification in the scripture about Enoch not being scripture. So because there's no clarification, his usage of terms which appear only in the book of Enoch are an implicit endorsement of the book of Enoch. Uh, so he clearly accepts the book of Enoch or he is evil, essentially. Now, I want to say geocentrism is true. Just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it is. And have you actually ever looked at the evidence for geocentrism and the arguments against it, and the same for heliocentrism theory? I believe if you actually looked at it with a fair and open mind, as I have, you would conclude that geocentrism is clearly taught in the Bible, firstly, and secondly, that geocentrism is, in fact, true. So, um, the Bible really does paint a clear picture of whether, uh, of geocentrism being true. Um, so I think you're really just assuming that geocentrism is a scientific falsehood when you haven't even looked at the scientific arguments and evidence. If you actually did your own research, did your own experiments, you would see that the flaws of geocentrism are, I mean, of heliocentrism are enormous. And geo, uh, the heliocentrism falsehoods are the foundation of evolution. Basically, if heliocentrism is true, that paves the way for evolution. That's how evolution came to be believed, because of heliocentrism. So, heliocentrism and evolution are interconnected intimately. You can't have one without the other, because they're, they're founded upon each other. So, heliocentrism, the theories, the, the evidence used to support heliocentrism, can only be accepted as evidence if you also accept as evidence that evolution is true. Evolution as in the contradicting the, the Genesis account. So, uh, I assume you believe creationism as I do. But creationism and heliocentrism in accordance with theories of the scientists cannot be reconciled. Only geocentrism or a different form of heliocentrism, which uh, the scientists do not 
use can be reconciled with the science of it. Okay, but as I said, the Bible clearly paints a picture of a geocentric universe and not a heliocentric. So, before saying the Bible is wrong because it's geo, I mean, the Book of Enoch is wrong because it's geocentric, you might want to take a look at that, see if geocentrism is true or not, and if the Bible actually teaches it, because I believe it's very clear the Bible does in fact teach the same thing about Enoch, uh, uh, about that Enoch does about uh, geocentrism. So, with that said, now the next part, regarding the angels making the ark, uh, no, it does not say angels made the ark. Did you know that the majority of scholars, essentially, especially uh, with the findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which find the Book of Enoch in Hebrew and Aramaic uh, copies, as well as Semiticisms in the text, in the Greek text and Ethiopian text uh, copies, uh, the scholars pretty much are all in agreement that the Book of Enoch was originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic. So, what was the Hebrew word or Aramaic word for uh, angels? It would be malak. Uh, uh, malak for the singular angel and malakim for plural angels. But what does malakim mean? This word means messengers and can refer to any kind of messengers, be it earthly or celestial. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily refer to angels. Secondly, the Bible, Genesis, does not say that Noah built the ark by himself, nor does the book of Enoch, parable sections, say the messengers built the ark all by themselves. Do you really think Noah built it all by himself? Wouldn't it make much more sense to hire people to build it if he could? If he hired people, he would be managing the project and thus Noah would be the builder, as well as the builders themselves would also be building it. And so this passage about messengers building the ark can easily be referencing celestial angels or earthly messengers who died right before the flood came. All these ind individuals would have built the ark under Noah's management, and this in no way contradicts the Bible. As the Bible does not say only Noah built it, uh, and Enoch does not say only the messengers built it. So you're primarily then your entire argument against the five books being one book and fluid and sync uh, are all based on supposed contradictions with the Bible that simply do not exist. But you came to those conclusions that they are contradictions because of a very flawed and incompetent analysis of the Book of Enoch. Uh, and a very unfair and closed-minded analysis, be it at that. Um, so, you then say, um, the Book of Watchers, the first section of the Book of Enoch, shows evidence of multiple stages of composition? No, it doesn't. You are just quoting a, a scholar who agrees with what you want to be true. Have you even looked at the evidence of those supposed multiple stages of composition are? Um, again, as I already said, the, the compilation into the complete Book of Enoch, as we have it today, must have occurred before the Messiah was born, as the Ethiopian Jews accepted all five portions as the same one book. And I see later on in the video, you cite some of your theories as to how there's multiple stages of composition, but contradictions internally do not indicate multiple stages of composition. It could just indicate an incompetent author, or it could indicate false uh, copies of manuscripts, or it could be a bad translation, or it could just be you having a flawed understanding of uh, the book you're reading. So. All the things you cite are very weak in regards to there being a multiple stage of composition. Um, you're assuming, essentially, your analysis is basically assuming that the English version, as you have it, is representative of the original, which is very ridiculous. 
you are basing your analysis of the Book of Enoch on an English version which has many flaws in it. That is completely bogus. But you don't do that with the Bible, do you? If you don't, then why do you do it with other books like Enoch? Okay. Um, so I'm going to pause this video and continue. Continuing my video analysis of the Book of Enoch, uh, whether it is scripture or not. Um, so, where continu continuing from where I left off, what you described uh, in the passage about the prison of angels in Enoch is not the prison of angels, but it is the prison of the stars, if you actually read what you quoted. It explicitly says it's the prison of the stars. And then it adds, in the very next sentence, and Enoch went to another place and saw the place of the angel's prison. There is also no contradiction regarding the place of the watchers. If you accepted all the books of scripture, you would know there are seven heavens and there are seven earths. And the angels are bound in the second heaven on or in the second earth. So, being... Uh, in the valleys of the earth <clears throat> and uh, at the end of heaven it can be reconciled when you understand it's referring to the second it's referring to the end of the first heaven and the earth of the second heaven okay that is where the other scriptures say where the angels are bound they are bound in the second heaven on the first, uh, in the second heaven, on the second earth, okay? So, I can quote you those books if you don't believe me, but these other books that I accept as scripture clearly refer to the second heaven as where the angels are bound, in Tartarus. Uh, so, also, you are wrong with the Bible's description of Sheol not matching. Have you ever read Luke chapter 16 and the so-called parable of Lazarus and Abraham? It clearly supports the book of Enoch as being used as scripture for its description. The vivid description of the book of, uh, of the Messiah of... Hold on. The vivid description of Shul that is contained in the Gospel of Luke is only found elsewhere in the book of Enoch. And it states the exact same thing. Book of Enoch and the Gospel of Luke both say there is a chasm that separates the righteous from the wicked. The book of Luke does not say there are four compartments, but it doesn't say there isn't four compartments. Uh, or, so Enoch supports what the Gospel of Luke says, but gives further information. So obviously here, the Messiah is making something up that has no prior uh, source, which would then wonder why would he make something up which the people wouldn't understand or think is ridiculous or false even. Uh, why would he do that? He wouldn't. He would use something which was known to be accepted as true. So, the Book of Enoch, which was known to have this very uh, vivid description, he, he uh, cited he was using the Book of Enoch, essentially. That's the only explanation, the best one, which explains why the Messiah used these kind of extra-biblical ideas. He wouldn't have used these extra biblical ideas if uh, the people didn't accept the book of Enoch as scripture. Because, uh, I mean, if at least some of the people didn't accept it as scripture, and if he didn't want them to accept it as scripture. Because since the book of Enoch alone teaches that, if he were to refer to this information, they would automatically associate it with the book of Enoch. Um, and... How did the writer of the Book of Enoch get this information if he wasn't a prophet? If he, the writer of Enoch is the only one who says this before the Messiah, and the Messiah also agrees with him, 
How did Enoch know that this is true if he wasn't a true prophet? See? It just doesn't make sense. The clear evidence that he that he that Enoch knew the truth. He was prophesying of the truth. So um also now I wanted to say the passage also does not say they shall not be resurrected to be judged. It says they shall not be raised from Shul. They shall not, they shall not be raised from their punishments. So, in other words, they will never stop being punished, it means. They will never leave Shul. They will be resurrected in Shul and then remain in Shul. They will be judged in Shul. The eternal judgment. You do not have to go to a certain place to be judged. The eternal judgment occurs wherever you are. It's a universal scope, and it happens in the blink of an eye. Okay? So, the Revelation of John does not say Shoal will be destroyed, but rather it says Shoal will be cast into the lake of fire, along with all those who are damned. Thus, uh, those cursed to live forever in Shoal will never leave it, though they will be resurrected in Shul and receive their eternal judgment in Shul, because Shul will be cast into the place of eternal judgment. Okay, so there's no contradiction. Regarding the 10,000 years, if you actually looked at uh, the Hebrew and the manuscripts themselves, and you looked at all the translations, you would know translation 10,000 years is not correct. Not all the manuscripts read the same translation, and the entire reference is t to 10,000 is itself not always meaning 10,000 in the Hebrew or Greek word. If I remember correctly, some manuscripts also read ages rather than years. Ages can be any length of time, from one second to thousands of years. So 10,000 ages, or in other words, 10,000 periods of time has no contradiction between the 70 generations. Uh, then you quote something as saying it says even until 10,000 years. If you actually read the translation information, the preface, you, of, the, of the translations of Enoch, you would know that that was an addition, an addition added by the translator and is not found in the manuscripts. Even, the word even, was added and thus they marked it in parentheses. Okay, so then you quote the whole thing about forever, but if you actually knew Hebrew, you would know Olam does not always mean forever, but can refer to a limited time period, a limited age. Furthermore, the phrase forever is itself not always referring to an eternal length of time. If you look at the word linguistically, if the word ever, linguistically and etymologically. So the connotation of forever as being an infinite length of time should not be imposed upon older English translations which you are basing your interpretation on. Because some of these modern connotations do not exist in the older English works. So, at any rate, the translation forever is not a correct translation of the Hebrew word. Um, and now, I'm just going to say Messiah, uh, Messiah, yeah. Messiah, in the Gospel of Matthew, references chapter 15 of Enoch as scripture. I can't remember exactly what chapter it is, but I remember the content. Basically, what Messiah says is he's arguing with Sadducees about whether there's going to be marriage in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They did not accept any books except the five books of Moses as scripture. So, what does the Messiah say? In response, the Messiah says, If you knew the scriptures, you would know that angels do not marry in heaven, it says. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's what he says. He says, he says, if you knew the scriptures, you would know there's no marriage in heaven, and no giving in marriage in heaven, because we will be just like the angels. So I ask you, where does the, do the scriptures 
state that uh, the angels do not marry in heaven. That there is no marriage in heaven, and the angels do not marry. Where do the scriptures say that? Nowhere does the Old Testament say that. But the book of Enoch, in chapter 15, explicitly says that. So, the Messiah says, if you knew the scriptures, you would know that angels do not marry in heaven. But only the book of Enoch claims that this is the case. So clearly the Messiah is saying a book outside the Old Testament is scripture, and the only book that can qualify is the book of Enoch, because that's the only book which says angels uh, are not permitted uh, to marry in heaven. That's the only book that explicitly says that. And even implicitly, there's not really many books that really imply that at all. The book of Enoch alone teaches that angels uh, do not marry in heaven. Um, so, if you just look at Enoch chapter 15, you see that the Messiah endorses uh, chapters 12 to 16 section, which you claim he does not, that is not authentic. But as I just explained, he clearly refers to this section as scripture. Okay, so, now I'm going to just tell you that you cited a you believe that you can support the idea of the origin of demons from the Old Testament in the Bible alone. However, your justification of it is a heresy and a blasphemy. That is the doctrine known as Traducianism. It basically asserts that we are not all unique. We all come from, we are all the same spirit. Okay? Which is a false belief. Uh, it contradicts the scriptures and is extremely blasphemous, which I can get to in another video uh, if you're curious, but that's what I believe. I believe it's a very blasphemous thing. So you were resorting to a heresy to support your doctrine. It's not justified to use heresy to support your doctrine. Um, and also your justification of Traducianism is based on an argument of silence, which is not proof in any capacity. Simply because the Bible does not say Eve was created by receiving another spirit does not mean she did not receive a spirit like Adam. The argument that Enoch is necessary to understand the Bible is not just about the origin of demons, but it's also about demo demonology in general. There's so much demonology information of the New Testament that just is not found in the Old, Old Testament. You might be able to draw some information about demons as you attempt to do in a video, but the majority of the demonology of the New Testament it just cannot be found in the, in the Old Testament. So there must be a source for all this information. There must be a source for all the extra biblical information that Paul uses in his letters and that uh, Stephen uses in his sermon in the book of Acts. These references to extra-biblical teachings were intended to be accepted by the Jewish populace. So if they were revealing new teachings, that wouldn't be good. Their entire point is that like the sermon that Stephen did was intended to be received as, you know these things, they're in your scriptures. So he's stating what is in the scriptures. But he says things that are not in the Old Testament. Stephen refers to things that are not in the New Testament. He refers to their burial place, which I'm pretty sure does not, is not mentioned in the Old Testament. He refers to, uh, that, that is the, the patriarch's burial place. Um, and as I said, he refers to the age of Moses when he killed the Egyptian, which is not contained in the Old Testament. So... Um, let's see here. I'm going to pause it here and continue in a moment. Continuing my video response. So, um, so other thing, it's not just about the origin of demons, but the New Testament also deals with the fate of demons, demon possession, and why they are allowed to be here. Why aren't they all God? Why are they still here? Why didn't he send them all to Tartarus? Why are some there and not others? These things aren't explained in the New Testament, 
but in the books that were rejected from the Bible, they are sufficiently explained. Um, also, furthermore, you are using the New Testament to base your doctrines on the origin of demons clearly being taught in the Bible. But we already know that demons are taught a lot in the New Testament. You need to prove it from the Old Testament only, not the New Testament, for your argument to have any weight. You are reading the New Testament into the Old Testament scriptures to argue for support of demonic origin. But this is not correct to go about uh, proving your point as it is circular reasoning. Furthermore, even if you are right and the Old Testament teaches sufficiently on demons, all the arguments I mentioned above prove Enoch is scripture if the Bible is scripture. As I said before, the New Testament clearly supports the Book of, e of Jubilees as scripture, and the Book of Jubilees teaches the pre-existence of each and every spirit of every creature. In other words, the Book of Jubilees is strongly against Traducianism, and the Book of Jubilees teaches all five sections of the Book of Enoch are scripture. Therefore, because the New Testament endorses the Book of Jubilees, and the Book of Jubilees endorses the five sections, the five sections are scripture, unless the New Testament is not scripture. So, um, but anyway, so on the authority of the Book of Jubilees, your idea about the true Traducianism is false. So because Traducianism, Traducianism is false, you cannot draw the origin of demons on that basis. Okay? Um, so when it says Adam received God's spirit, it does not mean that God's spirit is Adam's spirit. That would be heresy, blasphemy. Okay? It simply means God's spirit allows Adam's spirit to exist in Adam's body. And that is... Um, also, it is completely evil and contradicts the Old Testament, your belief in original sin and sin nature. According to Ezekiel and other books of the Old Testament... The Son shall not be punished for the sins of the Father. Yet you believe we are punished because of Adam, our Father. You believe we are sinners. We are, we are judged because of Adam. But Ezekiel goes on a, a rant, a long rant, about how the men will say to me, the humans will say to me, that is not fair, that is not just, that... Um, the Son is not judged for the sins of the Father. But Ezekiel very clearly says, No, it is just, and you are the ones who are being unjust in your in your analysis of of humanity. So and just a clear ignorance of the Old Testament scriptures teaching on righteousness and innocence, and we do not have a sin nature, that's not why we sin. Adam did not sin because he had a sin nature. He chose the sinner's free will. Satan chose the friend of the sinner's free will. We do not inherit a sin nature. We inherit the ability to sin, which Adam always had and didn't inherit. Everyone has the ability to sin. It's called free will. If we inherit a sin nature, that's not free will. Um, and so... Also, again, the scriptures do not teach mortality was caused by sin. For Messiah himself died, and animals and plants, all of whom you I believe are sinners, all die. All died. We all have the same spirit of life, but we don't have the same spirit of consciousness. We do not have a sin nature. That is an entire gross and blasphemous distortion of Paul's writings and the rest of the scriptures. You probably can't demonstrate any real argument for the original sin falsehood, except from Paul's writings. Um, but, um, that, as I said, it's a gr gross and blasphemous distortion of Paul's writings and the rest of the scriptures. Um... And, again, you're basing all of this information, like, on original sin and uh, sin nature from the New Testament. Primarily on the New Testament teachings, not the Old Testament. 
So your argument holds no weight about the Old Testament being sufficient for the origin of demons and other New Testament doctrines. You are, as Second Peter says, ignorant and unstable individuals who twist Paul's writings and the other scriptures, like Enoch and the rest of the Bible, to their own destruction. That's in Second Peter, it says that, chapter 3. Your belief that women do not pass out of sin nature, but that man does, is a direct teaching of the Gnostics. Um, is it any coincidence that your doctrine was not believed by any Jews or Christians prior to Augustine, and that after Augustine left Gnosticism, Man Manichaeism, and entered the church, and believed in free will at first, but in his later life, he recanted on free will and reverted back to many of his Gnostic opinions. And ever since then, Augustine has been one of the most famous and prominent men of the church and the primary basis of most of the doctrines of the church. It is because Augustine infected the church with Manichaean Gnosticism. Literally, no church father believed these things even in small part before the time of Augustine. Every church father emphasizes the supreme free will of all men and that no sin nature exists. They explicitly say often that there is no sin nature. Now, I want to say I believe the Messiah was God before he became a human, but he was not God as a human. It's impossible to be God and human in the, at the same time. Paul's letters clearly say Messiah emptied himself of all divine qualities in order to become a man. This emptying is typically called by church individuals as the kenosis of the Messiah. You can look it up. Kenosis. K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. Now, also to tell you, angels, according to the scriptures, have celestial bodies as well. So, you're wrong about angels being bodiless. And it does not say God did not decide to send the flood until he was 500 years old in the Bible. But even if it did, um, Enoch prophesied what was going to happen, but God perhaps didn't decide it until a later time. Prophesying what he was going to eventually decide does not mean he decided it beforehand. Just because the Bible doesn't say something does not mean that something else that does not say it contradicts it. And furthermore, the Bible says Enoch was taken. It does not say he was not allowed to return. And we see that he is going to return as one of the two witnesses according to the revelation of John. So he certainly is able to return whenever God wants him to. And no, it does not require Enoch to return to the earth, but rather... Noah could have gone up to Enoch to talk with him and receive books as Enoch in the parables section indicates. In the parables section, it clearly says Enoch was 500 years old. It's, by many translators, they amend it to Noah, but all the manuscripts say it was Enoch, who was 500 years old, in paradise, and he communicated with Noah and gave him the books. He gave him all the books that he wrote, that Enoch wrote. And Noah compiled them together. Uh, furthermore, the book of giants clearly records that the giants flew, went into heaven to see Enoch and asked Enoch for help from him. <coughs> so, uh, clearly, it's not necessarily the case that Enoch had to leave heaven, but they could have come to Enoch himself. Now, adding to what the Bible says is not a contradiction that needs to be emphasized. You cannot say that, but you seem to be implying that additions to the Bible are contradictions. Now, it's completely silly to reject chapters 12 to 16 of Enoch, when, as I showed before, the Messiah himself references chapter 15 of Enoch as scripture. Furthermore, you say, thou shalt not add, but you ignore the verses that say, thou shalt not remove. And you are clearly removing the scriptures from God's canon, from his Bible. And you are also adding your own false interpretations into the Bible, and you add your own versions of the Bible as being authoritative when they're not.
your translations of the Bible are not authoritative. When I say your translations, not the ones that you did, but the ones that you are choosing to accept. Whatever versions you use for your Bible, you are basing that on your interpretation, what you want to be true, and it's your, it's all you. It's, and so you're distorting the scriptures by picking the, the worst translations and the worst manuscripts. It doesn't make sense. And so you are guilty of this thing with the Bible and with many other books. You are the one who has been found out as a liar here, not the ones who accept the Book of Enoch as it originally was always accepted uh, for all of the former history by the true individuals of God. Um, also, there are not internal in, uh, there are not internal inconsistencies in the Book of Enoch. Enoch did not have a, have the power to leave heaven or enter it on his own will. God alone, with the angels, have the power to bring mere humans into heaven and back to earth. Enoch, if he was brought back to earth, could not go to heaven if he wanted to. He would have to wait until the angels or God brought him back. Because Enoch, as I said, is a mere human and powerless. Uh, um, so, also the Torah itself and the book of Judges refer to Dan, the land of Dan, long before the land of Dan was founded by the tribe of Dan. So if Enoch is to be, to be rejected for that, then so also should the Torah be rejected. Furthermore, your uh, Torah being the law of Moses. So furthermore, your criticism assumes Enoch is not a prophet, and so if Enoch was a prophet, he could prophesy the land of Dan before it existed. Furthermore, a scribe could have added the reference to the land of Dan, and another point, the land of Dan of Enoch perhaps is not the same land of Dan as the land of Dan of Israel. You are assuming they're the same. The land of Dan, the word Dan, uh, has a specific meaning in Hebrew, and could have been used to refer to a different piece of land before the land of Dan of Israel. So all your assumptions are completely unwarranted. Your argument about Isaiah and Ezekiel being sufficient for the origin of demons uh, being known falls apart, however, because Isaiah and Ezekiel were trying to help the Jews understand things. If Isaiah and Ezekiel were referring to information that they didn't know about, that the Jews didn't know about, the Jews would have not understood what they meant, and they would have not perceived the similarity between the kings and the fallen angels. The fact that the Jews were intended to understand Ezekiel and Isaiah's message implies that they knew of the fallen angel story before the prophet Isaiah and Ezekiel prophesied. This would still require a form of scripture teaching the fallen angel doctrines in such an explicit manner as the book of Enoch does. And um, I'm going to pause it here and continue in a moment. Continuing my analysis of the book of Enoch, uh, so, now, the Bible does not say that the giants only lived for 120 years. It says, from that moment that God spoke to Noah, the giants and the rest of mankind would only have 120 years left to live. In other words, God spoke this prophecy to Noah about the flood, having, uh, or whenever God said this, was he saying it to Noah or not? when he decided that they would have only 120 years left, he, it says from that point on, there would be 120 years left. So in other words, 120 years later, that's when the flood happened. It is not saying that they would only live to 120 years of life. It's saying they would, Everyone has only 120 years left before the flood occurs. Then your quotation of the giants being 3,000 L's in height ignores that some manuscripts read 300 L's, not 3,000. The giants were 300 L's high, not 3,000. 
Have you seen serpents and whales and other creatures being hundreds of feet large and long? There is no contradiction and absurdity about giants being 300 feet tall. Uh, not 300 feet, 300 yards tall. The quotation of the scientific law about the giants not being able to exist is ignoring uh, about the giants being 3,000, I mean, uh, 300 elves tall, not being able to exist, is ignoring how other animals are hundreds of feet tall and wide. So there is no contradiction with the law of science you quote, the square cube law, because other animals are able to be that large. So if animals can be hundreds of, of feet large, then so can humans, if, that, if they're in a different proportion. Okay, so you are assuming mankind's all, all density and bone weakness is the same now as the pre-fall world, too, which is a fallacy, and uh, your citation of modern genetics to reject the giants being 300 feet, uh, 300 hours tall, and again, 300 L's, because the manuscripts, the best ones, say 300, not 3,000. Um, so, that, uh, you're, you, what you said earlier about how, how men live hundred, like thousands of years, not thousands, but live to like a thousand years, but the, the giants could only live 220 years. That is a flat contradiction with modern genetics. Um, it just does not, uh, it does not work with it. It is a, so to say, to cite modern genetics as, ex, uh, modern science as exposing the, uh, inability for giants to be 300 feet tall, 300 hours tall, uh, would also expose your belief that the giants uh, would have, could have lived 120 years and that humans could have lived a thousand years. Because it's, according to modern science, so-called science, uh, that is an impossibility that humans could live for a thousand years. That's what the Bible says. So are you going to believe modern science? Or are you going to believe what the Bible says? So, really, you cannot base your beliefs on what so-called scientists say. You have to look at what the science actually states and be fair in your analysis of it, okay? Interpret the Bible, interpret the Book of Enoch as you the Bible. Otherwise, you're being unfair and having a double standard. Um, and, and to say that the first section of Enoch dates to 200 BC, that is absurd. You are quoting secular scholars who base their dating schemes on the assumption that prophecy does not exist. And they also date the book of Daniel to the same time period as the book of Watchers, which would destroy the book of Daniel's canonicity if their dating was true. If you reject their dating of Daniel, which I'm sure you do, because I'm sure you accept the book of Daniel as scripture, how then can you blindly accept their dating of the book of Enoch, the, the book of Watchers section? You are, it's unbelievable. Your interpretation is ridiculous. For if the individual had a vision of what Enoch prophesied, the entire five chapters of the, uh, that you are referencing would be authored by Enoch. Furthermore, it is quite clear that verse 1 in no way indicates Book of Enoch is not claiming to be written by Enoch, rather the Book of Enoch was compi compiled by someone else. And as the parable section says explicitly, Noah was the compiler. So if you also if you read verse two of Enoch chapter one, actually it does explicitly say, it explicitly states that Enoch wrote this book of Enoch. Um, and regarding quotations, a quotation by calling someone a prophet, and Second Peter saying all prophets of God are inspired by God and are scripture, clearly indicates that they regard the prophecy of Enoch as scripture. So, just because a quotation is, uh, right, just because something is being quoted does not make it scripture. But the key is how it's being quoted. Because it's being quoted as a 
it's being quoted as an authoritative source. Now, hold on a moment. Sorry, I apologize for that. I was almost out of battery power, power, so I had to plug my computer in. Okay, so I should be able to finish in this video. Um, so, um, so the context clearly supports it. Okay, the context clearly supports that the quotation of Enoch is being used as an authoritative quotation, not just a quotation of, this is a good teaching, but rather, he's quoting as a prophet. So it's an authoritative quotation. Um, and so, uh, and a final note, your analysis in this video that I'm responding to, only analyze the first two sections of Enoch. You did not analyze the other three sections. Okay, so that was a very incomplete analysis of the Book of Enoch. Uh, the Book of Jubilees does not contradict the Bible. It is completely ridiculous. The solar calendar is clearly taught in the Bible, not the lunar calendar, and the Bible does not ever mention a new moon once, because that is a false translation. It does not say moon in the word. It's the word Kodesh, or Kodesh, is not, does not mean moon. It does not mean new moon. It means renewal, uh, month, and but they are translating it as new moon because they're assuming the new month is based on the moon. Okay, so it's a uh, fallacious translation based on assumptions that just are not there in scripture. There is no scriptural commandment in the Bible to follow the lunar calendar. That is a bold-faced lie. Um, so, I can show you the evidence. It's very clear that the solar calendar, calendar is explicitly taught in the Bible time, time and time again, and the lunar calendar is never taught once. I can refute that uh, if you are willing to hear the evidence. Um, so, why should we, as a final summary, why should we trust things other than the Bible? Because Deuteronomy says any prophet who speaks is to be accepted as a true prophet unless they are proven to not be a true prophet, and that this process of analysis should also be applied to the Bible in a, a fair capacity. I believe this video series that I've uh, done, this, this video, is a fair and open-minded analysis of the Book of Enoch. I have shown how your allegations do not uh, expose the Book of Enoch as false, does not show a contradiction, and basically uh, I show the evidence that if a Bible is scripture, then the Book of Enoch must be scripture as well. And um, I also believe that every book must be accepted as scripture. Every book must be accepted as true. Every source must be accepted as valid until you can prove it's false. Okay? Everything must be assumed to be true, innocent until proven guilty. The Bible teaches that very good, pr true principle. Everyone must be innocent, must be viewed as innocent until proven guilty. You did not prove the book of Enoch guilty, so I go by the scriptural commandment and the logical and philosophical commandment to assume everything is true until proven otherwise. And the prophetic nature and the prophetic superiority, prophetic nature 
in the moral purity of the Book of Enoch, to me, are enough indications that it is scripture. But not only that, but we also have all the prophets, all the apostles, and the Messiah himself clearly endorsing the entirety of the Book of Enoch. So that is my my analysis on the Book of Enoch, and I hope you will have watched this entire video, and I hope this gives you something to think about, and I look forward to comments, messages, and I hope that this will lead people to accept the Book of Enoch. Uh, thank you, and shalom.